going to speak about, uh, the title of this talk is called Growing Fears, Mixed Experiences, Weak Hopes, The Fight Against Anti-Semitism is Still Necessary. Professor Weiss Kirsten is the personal representative uh, of the chair in office of the OSCE in combating anti-Semitism, and he's the spokesperson on foreign affairs for the SPD group within the OSCE. Currently, he's a personal representative uh, for combating anti-Semitism in the organization for the security and cooperation in Europe, the OECDE, and he's been, he held this position since 2005. He's a member of the German Federal Parliament, the Bundestag, and he has been so since 1976. He's currently the spokesperson for the SPD parliamentary group um, with the Bundestag Committee on Culture and Media Affairs, and he's held this position since 1999. And he's the chairman of the German-Russian parliamentarian group in the Bundestag. Um, since 1992, he's been a member of the Helsinki Citizen Assembly, a controlling body of peace and civil rights movements uh, based in, uh, in, in sort of movement that came from Havel. In 1992, he became a member of the acting federal administration of the German Czech and the German Slovak Society. And since 1976, he's been a member of the German Bundestag Committee on Foreign Affairs. I first met Professor Weisskirsten at the um, Herzliya Conference, and I met him actually in this very special meeting. Um, it was a best practices meeting that was held in the Bundestag for the OSCE on combating anti-Semitism. Um, he also has quoted books. Uh, the most recent is a special meeting on anti-Semitism in conjunction with the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly uh, meeting. Um, so he is a scholar, uh, I think an active politician, especially on issues of human rights, and somebody who has been uh, very active in leading on issues of anti-Semitism uh, in the current context. So it's really, it's an honor that you're here, and I welcome you. Thank you, Charles. And I'm honored, not only that you invited me, but as, I, as far as I saw, <coughs> I'm the only German uh, that you invited. No. No? There is, There's a few more. Probably. Okay, there yeah. are more yeah. Germans than... But I would like to put this point at first. I, I was born in the last months of the Second World War and grew up in a Germany um, what have what has delivered the most terrible assault ever on human beings, the Holocaust. And this Holocaust, this is, till the end of times, engraved in the name of my country. Hitler did it. Um, since then, we, I mean the politicians, we Germans, we should be obliged to fight against anti-Semitism when it begins, from the very first moment on. That's a kind of a moral responsibility, but more than that, political obligation. So this is the reason. I do think why I'm standing here in front of you. And the OSCE is one of the tools, one of the political tools that you can put in place if necessary. But you have to understand that the OSCE is not a legally binding organization, but only a kind of a politically binding organization. 56 member states from Canada, United States of America, to the end of Russia, <coughs> Vladivostok. 56 member states. And this organization is only one instrument that you can use in the fight against anti Semitism. There are several other tools. But if you try to use the tools of the OSCE, then, again, you should know, there is no 
army, no police, in order to implement the decisions and the commitments that the member states have accepted. But only a kind of moral expectations, and this is then my work, to try to look into the different member states, what are they doing in order to implement these commitments that they have accepted. And in the fight against anti-Semitism, roughly 50 commitments are where and have been accepted by the member states. And if you look into the segments of these commitments, ranging from, for instance, Holocaust education, Holocaust Remembrance Day, to legislation. What kind of understanding do we have in the whole OSCE region? What is really anti-Semitism? We have worked out a working definition to understand what anti-Semitism really is. So these different commitments are on the table and my work is then to try to find out in what way are the different 56 member states implementing these commitments into their own national <coughs> culture and political processes. <coughs> and you should know then, <coughs> because of the fact that we as OSCE cannot press these states that although they have admitted these commitments, that they are in the process of implementation clear-cut. I only can name them. What are they doing? In what way are they fulfilling? Or in what way they are failing in order to implement these commitments? And, uh, for instance, the working definition on anti-Semitism is only put in place by a minority of these 56 member states. Some member states are ready to accept these principles. Others are rejecting these principles. And others are reluctant to put them in place. Take the case of Holocaust education. We have delivered a book dealing with guidelines for the ministries of education in the respective different member states in order to give them ideas how to create new educational systems, how to define curricula, how to give material, materials to the teachers so that they can use these material, materials into the cl classroom in order to bring to pupils and students a better understanding of uh, what Holocaust really was. And in, a, in, a, in an overview, I, I saw that roughly 25% of the, of, the, of the 56 member states were ready to implement these guidelines. Roughly 25% are objecting to do anything about it. And the others were shilly shally, so to say. They are doing something some of them are more than reluctant. So this is then the picture of reality. You have to see that on the top level of the ministerial conferences, uh, these OSCE member states are ready 
to create a kind of new formula. But then, if it comes to the real question, how to bring then these ideas through from the top level of the, of the state leaders into the segments of government and then pouring into the segments of society and societies of these 56 member states, then there are remaining questions and some not only reluctance but kind of resistance to be seen in reality. So this is the this is the situation we are facing. And if you look into the problems, where are these different countries located? And you will find out that especially when you go more to the east of the OSCE space, then you find reluctance and sometimes resistance. Especially if you go to the not EU countries, European Union countries, then you find out Central Asia, Russia, the Russian Federation, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova. These are countries, uh, if you look, if you take a serious look what is going on inside these countries, that there are more questions to be seen than uh, serious answers. Take the case of, I only would like to take Hungary as one of these cases. <clears throat> Hungary is a member of the European Union and they worked actively to be a full-fledged member of the European Union and tried very hard to meet the criteria to be a, an acknowledged and recognized member of the European Union and they made it but after they uh, uh, stepped into the European Union Nowadays you will find out that there are some problems to be seen that you hope that they, they were not to be seen. Now, they sometimes made the kind of um, interpretation for us Westerners, so to say, that these countries are ready to meet all the societal problems in which they are living. And uh, now you see that they are going through a very difficult transformational process from former communist style system, political system, into a democratic oriented system. And Sometimes I do have the feeling that they try to, to bring about a kind of a lip service to, to us and to others who were the ones to decide whether these countries, especially Hungary, uh, could get the full-fledged membership of the European Union. And then, nowadays you will find out that these are countries struggling with the problems of transformation processes. One key point is, in this regard, <clears throat> that sometimes when societies and nation states are in a new phase of building up their own consciousness, and when consciousness of the old empire the old regime are fading away communist style system and you are not ready to create a new a new kind of foundation of this uh, new uh, political consciousness 
then the right extremists do have a, a good possibility to, to fill this vacuum that you will find out when you switch over from one political system into a different one, into the next phase. And in this regard, if you have a kind of an old style right wing and right, right extremist movement, then in, inherited in this movement are segments of neo-Nazi orientation. And nowadays you will see, if you go to Budapest, massive demonstrations and you can see the symbols of the Nazi area that the people are showing in the street. Or take the case of Ukraine. There is uh, one of these universities, Maup, clear-cut anti-Semitic, clear-cut. And uh, I talked to uh, President Yushchenko on this point, and there is no doubt that the political leadership in these countries, Hungary and Ukraine, are against that kind of right extremist orientation, against a new billet or character of neo-Nazism, a uh, new uh, recreated uh, political class, but they are really strongly against this development. But there is this but. It's not only the, the, a good point and a good um, starting point in, in, in this development that the leadership is clear-cut. The real point is, what about the society? What about the, the inner conflicts in these societies? How are they met? And what kind of political instruments is the political class then using in order to convince the, the people and the population that democracy is at stake? when right extremists are on the rise. And in the back of this, uh, behind them, of these right extremist groups are, is anti-Semitism on the rise too. This, these are the challenges of the transformational uh, situations in which these countries are living. Or take the case of Poland. There are, I don't know how many, but several hundreds or something <coughs> Jews living in Poland. But there is a tremendous uh, anti-Semitism to be seen. Symbols you can figure out. If you go into a normal hotel in, uh, in Warsaw, that you f there you can find symbols of anti-Semitism. You can buy there. There is a kind of uh, uh, a symbolized Jew to be seen. You can buy this symbol. This uh, in this size, and you can find out that he is looking like the Jutsus in the, in the German uh, films of the 30s with the same face. And uh, these are problems to be seen all over, all over the Eastern European countries. So in this regard, there are growing fears to be seen. And what I have seen as you've pointed out as a personal representative of the chairman in office of the OSCE, that my experiences tell me that I do have mixed experiences. One is that 
The leadership of these countries are clear cut against anti Semitism, but on the other, there are growing problems to be seen. And how to meet these problems? I only would like to point out one example, um, talking about a different country, not Eastern European country, but Great Britain. In Great Britain, um, there has been established a, a 15 members group of the Westminster, of the, of the lower house, of the parliament, and made, a, in, made an inquiry and delivered a report on how to fight against anti-Semitism in Great Britain. And they delivered 35 very concrete recommendations in a uh, lasting 11 months um, work. And in the end of these uh, recommendations, now the, uh, the government of the United Kingdom does now have a lot of more possibilities to act against anti-Semitism. So this is one of, the, one of the best examples that I've seen. And these good examples I would like to universalize in the whole sphere, in, in the whole space of the OSCE. Because I do, I'm, I'm convinced and I do hope that if you catch parliamentarians, members of, of the different um, nation, national parliaments in order to confront these problems, then there is a good possibility to build a bridge between the conviction of the state leaders and then to kind of bringing about this, this new attitude towards all the different segments of societies which are up to now reluctant fighting uh, against anti-Semitism. So in Great Britain that was a wonderful experience and uh, for instance in my country in Germany we do have a, a hearing in uh, June 16 in order to try and find out what can we do better in Germany in order to fight against anti-Semitism and the case of Germany is very interesting, although in Germany anti-Semitism has begun in its brutal, most brutal form and Holocaust uh, has been invented. We do have, and the different surveys uh, you can compare, roughly and at least 10% of the whole population in Germany who are anti-Semitic in his attitudes. And this is since the first survey uh, has been delivered since the early 80s. Till today, roughly the same figure. And sometimes these figures are higher than 10%. For instance, dealing with the last Israeli uh, Hezbollah war, then we, we have found a peak of more than 15% uh, anti-Semitic um, attitudes. So, although I do think so that in Germany the, there is a full awareness uh, that we have to fight from the beginning on uh, against anti-Semitism, there is still this hardcore attitude towards Jews. And lastly, if you go into different countries all over the OSCE sphere, then you will find out that there is a new kind, new form of anti-Semitism to be registered, to be seen on the spot. The old form is anti-Judaism, rooted in two long old forms of traditional attitudes towards Jews 
originating from Christian ideology. Nowadays, if you go to um, different regions in immigrant societies in all over Europe, take the case of Great Britain, um, Pakistani-oriented uh, Muslim uh, uh, communities, or go to France, um, Muslim orientation mostly coming from the Maghreb, from North Africa, or go to uh, Germany. Um, most of them, these Muslim immigrants are coming from Turkey. Different types of Muslim orientation. In the case of Turkey, there is a secular state. And um, then you will find out that in these new segments of societies where immigrants are strong, they are related in the third and the fourth generation to where? To Almana, to some, some television uh, sources coming from the Near East, from Egypt or other places where the elders of Zion plays a significant role. So these two forms are intermingling each other and uh, in this regard are really dangerous to be seen. So what is my hope? My hope is that if you can understand better these new forms and types of anti-Semitism, uh, then you can fight better against these forms. So knowledge is one thing, but the key is not only knowledge, the key is education. And if you have in mind that education has to do with creating attitudes for the younger ones, so that they are aware of the fact what is going on in the street or in the bus or wherever, in the sport field, wherever they are ex ex experiencing or facing the problem that whoever is representing a minority and he is attacked by, by some other who feels that he is the or she is the majority representing, then he has to stand up, he has to speak out. He has to fight against from the beginning. And in this regard, our guidelines are telling teachers and the younger generation that we have to, to create these kind of democratic-oriented values. And in this regard, I do hope, I do really hope, that um, there is not only uh, there are not only mixed experiences, there are not only growing fears, which I felt after these years, but there are possibilities to act against, and these are hopes to be seen. And in the OSCE world, we are trying to do our best, although, as you have heard, the tools are weak. But the consciousness, of the people I've seen are more lively than I thought in the beginning. And in this regard, I do think that hope in the end will be stronger than the problems we are facing. Thank you. So thank you very much. So we have a few questions now. Anybody would like to start off? Yes, I, I have a question about your um, your hope for education as the um, the ultimate solution. It it seems to me that, and I'm, and I'm thinking in particular about the anti-Semitism in the immigrant communities in in Europe, the um, the, the second type that you spoke about. Um, I'm right now in the middle of Ayan Kirsi Ali's book mm -hmm. about um, her her experiences growing up in Somalia and in um, Nairobi, and, and that. I'm getting the impression from that book and from many other sources that the hatred of Jews 
is um, is so much, and the demonization of Jews is so much a part of so many um, Muslim cultures. Even when there are no Jews present whatsoever in those cultures, um, that um, when these immigrant communities come to Europe, they are bringing with them a, a long heritage of, of hostility towards Jews. And that it seems to me that the, um, to re-educate and to re-socialize them requires getting them to give up a, a very large segment of the culture that they're bringing with them. That it's not simply a matter of exposing them to a Holocaust education program in, in a European school system. It's not simply a matter of exposing them to, um, to somebody talking about how bigotry is bad or presenting them with data about Jews, but rather getting them to part with something which is very much part of their essence, which is their, um, the culture they're bringing with them. Um, that would require a major effort of re-socialization a major effort of almost reprogramming. And I'm wondering, given the weak tools that you have, um, what hope is there for, for doing that? <laughs> well, my hope is that uh, these, these people can get the message. And uh, that means that they can understand what is really going on. We have, uh, our work is at least twofold. First is, to improve the process of integration for these alienated people. Because if they do still have the, the experience that in the reality they do not have equal rights, and this is the case in Europe, then they do seek a kind of, of excuse and trying to find out a scapegoat and you know historically who was the scapegoat and this is one thing to improve the societal processes of integration and judging this problem you will find out that most of the Western European countries are now <coughs> being aware of the fact that they have to do more than they did in the past in order to create these uh, integrational processes. That's one thing. And the other, interlinked with this process, we have to convince the younger generations of Muslims that if they would like to live in our countries, they have to, I, I would put it not only re-socialized, but to civilize themselves in a way that they are ready to, to share with us the common view that has been emerging since the end of Second World War that we need each other irrespectively of where we are coming from. If you are a Jew or not a Christian or I don't know what, we have to live together and we have to share our common values. And this is what you're talking about, kind of, uh, uh, yes, re-education, but it's even more than that, it's to, to understand that we only can live in common when we share our values here in, in our space. So these two processes, we have to link to each other, and this is a tremendous task that we are facing. I wonder what you thought of Sarkozy's original plan for Holocaust education to match each French child with a Jewish child who perished in the Holocaust. I, I do think that this is a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. The only question is remaining, <coughs> at what age can you do this? There is a debate in mm -hmm. France uh, when you can start this. 
but the, this is a wonderful idea. And you should know that in France, earlier, and in Germany, for instance, we, I mean the states, we are financing, having meetings with, uh, with Jewish um, uh, uh, students. Not only in Germany or in France, but for instance in Auschwitz. So this is one of the key elements of our, uh, of our programs, so that the, young, the younger ones uh, can have a chance <coughs> to, to understand the other, and then to recognize that he or she, the other, is roughly than I am. There is no real difference between us. Professor, I uh, would like your comment, and similar to what the gentleman in the back talked about, the education. I myself, I was born in Hungary and naturalized and came here in early 41, very luckily, and, oh. and naturalized. We, uh, we lost our family, so I can testify to the Holocaust. My question to you is, if you take away the violence and the feeling in uh, Arab states about the territorial claims of Israel and the anti-Semitism which is focused upon property and the Palestinian drama and Israel itself. And then you take away the threats that over the course of the uh, Middle Ages that you had religious opposition to the Jews as being the ones in the Catholic Church until Vatican II was involved in that direction. Sartre in his book and others have tried to come to grips with what is the real core. You take a country like Hungary or Poland, where there's not a territorial concern about losing property. There's not a religious concern anymore. But there's this, in Hungary, what, innate hatred of Jews, which are exhibited in a recent movie I saw, which is called The Counterfeiters. And if you see that, it's a German movie. Yeah. It's about uh, uh, Jews that were sent to Saxhausen, yeah. that camp, in order that, that they could promote the counterfeiting mm. of the Bank of England pound to break the bank, and they were treated there, and the word is vermin, the intense hatred. I could never, having gone through good educations with all people in the United States where there is anti-Semitism, but it's not the kind of hatred that you, ex you just described to us in Poland and in Hungary in the streets. Now, in terms of that kind of education, with the leaders of those countries, Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, saying, well, we're against it, what is the real core problem that tends to persist if you remove the angry anger over property, anger over Palestine, and anger over Christ and the religion? What is the core of this issue, really? I mean, it's a mystery to me. I agree. I can give you my personal yes, I would like to hear uh, yes. uh, judgment. Uh, it's not a judgment, but only kind of uh, reflection. Um, in my personal understanding, there is a deep-rooted religious problem between Jews and Christians, especially if you go to Orthodox churches, more than uh, to Catholic or Protestant churches. You are from Eastern Orthodox? Yeah. 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 So this is one of the reasons, in my understanding. Uh, and I have to say, and I, and I have to regret, that the new pope reinvented a prayer, as you probably have read, on Easter, uh, dealing with uh, with the role of Jews. And I do hope that uh, these days when he is here, he will get the message that he has to reform this step backwards. Uh, the Vatican uh, uh, in, in, the six, in the 70s, the, uh, the uh, conciliarity process, uh, uh, had decided to to leave this behind. Yes. But Benedict 
brought it back. So this is a dangerous, real dangerous prayer. Uh, Friday Easter, where in this prayer, uh, the role of Jews uh, were coming again to the forefront. Mm. And then you know what 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 the what one of the problems is. And in this regard, I do hope that Pope Benedict is coming back to the Polish Pope. He was, in this regard, a real friend of Jews, because he grew up, as you know, nearby Auschwitz. And he personally witnessed what has happened in this death camp. And he was Although he was a traditionalist in some regard, he was clear cut towards Jews. And Benedict, and I must say, although he is a German, he should know what he is doing in this regard. And he should immediately uh, come back to the prayer that has been inaugurated in the 70s. Do you think, Professor, in countries like Hungary and Poland and Ukraine, which uh, had the anti-Semitism after Pope John the 23rd and Vatican II <coughs> rolled back that mention of the Jews, that that hatred is religious-based? Is that yeah. and That's what I'm talking about. Uh, I just want to point out uh, something, and then I would have a question about it. Uh, the uh, new anti-Semitism that, that is mentioned here occasionally is relatively a, a, new, a new product, but essentially it is the old Christian anti-Semitism which was picked up by the Arabs yeah by this, especially by the Islamic leadership of the Arab world, already at the beginning of the 20s, yeah. the, of the previous century. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's important to note that the forefront, the leadership for the anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist, came not from political circles, no. it came from the religious. Yes. I mean, the whole objection <coughs> to the Jews establishing themselves as independent people came from the religious point of view. Uh, the average person had no uh, political uh, uh, inclination to uh, deal with it one way or another. Uh. Essentially, it, nothing much changed. Uh, even the uh, leadership of the Palestinian movement, although it dressed itself as, as a political system, uh, 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 Bobby, uh, basically they had followed exactly the same pattern and the same uh, characteristics that were established by the Mufti and the other uh, religious leaders. Now what, the, what had happened in the last, uh, I, I don't know, that I can't pinpoint the exact time when it started, that the, uh, that leadership, that is uh, Muslim leadership realized that they could take the Christian manufactured anti-Semitism, repackage it, and deliver it back to Europe. Now they are basically selling back to Europe the same merchandise that they took from Europe yeah. because there was no anti-Semitism in the Islamic world before the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century to be more correct. And it was picked up from Europe by uh, the first uh, Arabs who went to Europe for their higher education. And that's what the, one of the things that they brought back with them. Yeah. Now, this is now being now spread all over Europe, especially. Giving the democratic system in Europe, what do you think can be done in order to uh, uh, 
subverge this uh, sub this uh, movement before it becomes worse, especially when we remember that the democratic system failed to subdue the Nazi movement. Now, you had a lesson, your experience. Uh, it's nice to be democratic, it's nice to, to, to maintain free speech, but it's, it's stupid to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your, what is, what can be considered? Yeah, that's the, that's the main and crucial question. If you, then you have to figure out that we do have different forms of uh, democracies in, in Germany. Take the case of France. France is based on laïcité, a secular state, and the state has not the right to judge on religious things. In this regard, Sarkozy is in a, in a not that very comfortable situation. So the state has no right to intervene directly into religious matters. Take the case of, say, Germany. There is a kind of cooperation between the state and the churches. And in this regard, cooperation between the state and Muslim communities. We can, if necessary, create rules, not laws, but rules. They have to commit and accept. This is the case for Germany. So, the point is, what, I was, what I'm trying to say is that there is not a clear-cut common answer of this problem, you described correctly, uh, but different answers within the European Union because the nation state have differences. So, what to do then? Again, I would, I would make the point again that it is necessary <clears throat> to, to strengthen the processes of integration and to give all the members of the society, wherever they are coming from, from Muslim orientation, Christian orientation, to give them the possibility to cooperate to each other. So that this kind of cooperation leads to better understanding that if you are a Jew or Muslim, that this is not a, a point of difference. But we all are individuals, we all are members of the same society, and we have to stick to the rules of the society. If there are problems to be seen, conflicts, then we should uh, try to work out kind of uh, formulas, how we are acting in these conflicts. And the most, uh, uh, so to say, uh, regularly, uh, uh, regulatory <laughs> um, law, so to say, or rule is that we have to act peacefully, although there, there are problems to be solved. And uh, not only problems, but conflicts to be seen. So, in this regard, again, I do hope that this kind of civilization, civilizational process is now being enhanced by, by uh, looking into the different problems of our societies. But you are right in saying nobody knows the outcome of this. And if necessary, if necessary, the state has to be strong in order not to be destroyed again, as we have witnessed in the end or the beginning of the 30s of the last century. So I'm going to ask a question when you were asked the yeah. second question. So you, you, in a sense, focused on the 
internal societal issues of anti-Semitism uh, within the OECD <coughs> and the European Union. So I, I want to challenge you to look to external and foreign affairs, uh, mm -hmm. which you're an expert of. In Article 3 of the Convention, um, for the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, Article 3 stipulates very yeah. clearly and simply yeah. that incitement to genocide is against the Convention. Yeah. Ahmadinejad, I think anybody who looks at what he's been saying over the last several years consistently and clearly is inciting to genocide based on what the Convention's definition is. What is the OECD, so OECD's responsibility internationally to this phenomenon, one? And two, given uh, the European Union in general, and Germany specifically, given the threat of another Holocaust, and I'm choosing my words very del deliberately and carefully, what should be the reaction, what can be the reaction of Europe, of Germany, to stop this disaster in the making? Number one, the OSCE has no tool uh, available against this. The only thing what we can do is have a debate on this and uh, speaking out. <coughs> and this has been done. Uh, secondly, what can the European Union do? As you know, we are in the in in process of uh, negotiating and the United States of America uh, plus Russia, plus China, plus then the EU3, that's France, that's Great Britain and Germany, we are in the same boat, so to say, uh, acting against uh, Iran. And you know that uh, the Security Council delivered uh, several uh, measures in order to strengthen the process of uh, boycott. <clears throat> but uh, if this is not enough, then uh, Sarkozy made the uh, proposal to enhance this process of bargaining. Uh, and if uh, Ahmadinejad is not ready to, uh, to meet the challenges and the, the, the questions that, that we have put uh, to him, then we should use uh, different new um, measures and the European Union would be ready to deliver. This is uh, in the process now of debating in the different member states and uh, uh, I don't know when the time will come but we are in a, in a heat debate on this. Uh, uh, there are different member states who are not opposing to this but reluctant to new boycotts um, because they argue uh, the United States of America uh, has been uh, putting in place boycotts and what was the outcome? So this is the question that, that they are now uh, uh, bringing forward. Uh, but uh, again, we are debating this and if necessary, we are ready to uh, to, pre to make it much more precise and painful, especially for, uh, for, for the political elite of this uh, uh, country in Iran. Um, and if necessary, if, uh, for instance, Israel um, uh, comes to the conclusion that uh, that kind of uh, measures are not helpful, then Israel is free to act, and if necessary, then uh, the, uh, especially Germany, we have been debating on this since several uh, months, then we are uh, someone to support, if necessary. So just to follow up quickly, do you think the European Union or members of the European Union would engage in something more substantial than sanctions? Would they, would they engage in military action if it became apparent that existential real danger to the future of Israel? Uh, if, if Israel is the one to decide on this, and uh, that's, uh, that's an autonomous uh, government, then uh, I, I don't see any, any objection uh, if this uh, is needed. Mm. 
you? Well, just, I'm still absorbing your answer to that. But you, you don't. I mean, I, I, I hear you saying that you don't have an objection, but I'm wondering if you, that my observation of Europe's behavior with regard to Israel is that it's been a very mixed level of, of, of support, even when Israel behaves very cautiously. And I'm just wondering if, um, if, if Israel were going to act, you know, how confident are you that if Israel were going to act under circumstances like that, that the support would really be there? Well, and I'm not your opinion now, but your prediction of how Europe would, would deal with it. Yeah, uh, as always, when, when Israel is acting, there is the debate in uh, several countries. Um, but take the case of the Lebanon war. Uh, there was no real critique uh, against Israel to be seen. Some journalists uh, wrote some critical articles, yes. But uh, in, for instance, in the Bundestag, the German government were supporting, and uh, we we gave uh, Israel what is Israel wanted to have. Uh, not only submarines, we are the ones to deliver submarines, but uh, the German Bundeswehr, the German army, is uh, is in place there uh, uh, to strengthen uh, Unifil two. Uh, the, the second uh, uh, new mandate. Uh, so uh, only take this point if necessary, and if Israel comes to the conclusion they have to act, then it's Israel <coughs> to uh, to do that. And there will be, in my personal opinion, yes, there will be debates then, but no objection to this. Uh, if necessary, military option. Anybody else? Okay, so that's it. So, on behalf of ISA, I really am grateful for you to come all the way here to, to join us, and it was really an honor to have you. Thank you.